think it's five minutes are past. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, good afternoon to all of you uh, that have the interest on, on joining the discussion with us, and I hope it's a discussion, not just uh, us talking from this panel towards you. We will try to create a space at the end for question and answers and make this interactive. My name is Manuel Marques Pereira. I am the head of the vision of the International Organization for Migrations, for Migration, Environment, Climate Change, and Disaster Risk Reduction or MECR, so it's easier for you and for me, because I don't have to repeat this uh, too many times. I would like to welcome you all to this event of the SB58. Professor? No, 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 no. The last seat, I will, will put a lady here so that no lady should be at the edge of the table. Uh, this SB58 side event towards people-centered adaptation, enabling choice, resilience, and mobility. This event is co-organized by IOM, the Action by Churches Together Alliance, the ACT Alliance, Bread for the World, and the Danish Church Aid. Uh, the event will last around 75 minutes, and we like to ensure that we have a bit of a conversation, as I said, at the end. Um, I wanted to say that this event is not an event to create a, a monochordic message. This is an event of creating a convening space where people with close or divergent ideas can discuss about a topic that is very complex and for which are many perspectives. And IOM is extremely pleased to have this different group of people. Not sure if we all agree on all, but at least we can do what is required, we sit together and we dialogue about these questions. Migration and mobility has to be about the dialogue, and we are very happy to be doing this. I would like, since we have done the, the first part, to introduce to you, uh, to give uh, the opening remarks uh, for this event, Mr. Mr. Frot Nengard, if I hope that I have said it well, the co-chair of the executive committee of the Varsau International Mechanism for Loss and Damage within the UNFCCC structures. Um, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the welcome and, and uh, thank you for all participants in this room this afternoon. Uh, busy times here in, in Bonn for all of us. I'm very pleased to, to be here with you this afternoon uh, and I want to thank the organizers, uh, IOM, the Action by Churches, <laughs> Hello, Coco. Um, uh, Act Alliance, Spread for the World, and uh, Danish uh, Church Aid for the invitation to provide some opening remarks uh, as co-chair of the WIM Executive uh, Committee. So again, from my side, welcome to all of you, also my fellow panelists here at the table. Climate change, as we know, is one of the most urgent challenges of our time. The latest IPCC report uh, have confirmed what we already know. Human-caused climate change is affecting weather and climate extremes in every region across the globe, leading to widespread adverse impacts and related losses and damages to people and to our planet. The growing gravity, scope, and frequency of loss and damage in all regions of the world is resulting in devastating economic and non-economic losses, including forced displacement and impacts on cultural heritage. This underlines the crucial importance of an adequate and effective response to loss and damage. The Warsaw International Mechanism is the main vehicle under the climate convention process for averting, minimizing, and addressing uh, loss and damage associated with climate change impacts by enhancing knowledge, action, and support. Through the Warsaw International Mechanism, efforts are made to strengthen synergies and coherence of such efforts across a broad range of communities of practice and stakeholders. The Executive Committee of the Warsaw International Mechanism guides the implementation of the functions of the WIM through a work plan that sets the direction of work 
over a five-year uh, period. In September last year, the Executive Committee developed its second five-year rolling work plan for the period 2023 to 2027. It's the second five-year rolling work plan of the Executive Committee, and it maintains the five strategic work streams from the first work plan, and they are slow onset events, non-economic losses, action and support, comprehensive risk management, and human mobility. When it comes to the functions under these work streams, the second five-year rolling work plan represents a clear shift from information collection and initial scoping to catalyzing solutions on the ground. This includes a strong focus on implementing the mandate to develop technical guides in response to a request by COP25 and a strong focus on being more responsive to the needs expressed at the country level. This shift in focus of the work of the Executive Committee can be seen also in the third rolling uh, uh, work plan, the plan of action of the task force on displacement. And this uh, um, plan of action covers the 2022 to 2024 period. And this was also adopted at the last meeting of the executive committee in September last year. The third uh, plan of action of the task force on displacement seeks to support parties in implementing the recommendations based on the work of the task force on displacement in its first phase on integrating approaches to averting, minimizing, and averting, uh, addressing displacement related to the adverse impact of climate change. Through these efforts, the task force on displacement contributes to the implementation of the functions of the WIM related to human mobility associated with the impacts of climate change, including by maximizing synergies among relevant stakeholders and processes. It aims to do so through practical, user-friendly tools. This includes the development of three technical guides that will contribute to implementing the Executive Committee's uh, work uh, mandated by COP25. And I'll mention uh, what these uh, three uh, guides are about. So the first is a technical guide developed jointly with the expert group on non-economic losses, on averting, minimizing, and addressing non-economic losses in the context of human mobility. It includes impacts on indigenous and local knowledge, societal identity, and cultural heritage. The second guide is a technical guide on integrating linkages between human mobility and climate change into relevant national climate change planning processes, such as the process to formulate and implement national adaptation plans in collaboration with the least developed countries expert groups, and also related to the work on nationally determined contributions. The third one is a technical guide on accessing finance for averting, minimizing, and addressing the impacts of displacement. And this guide has been developed in collaboration with the expert group on action and support under the executive committee of the WIM. Through the development of these technical guides and the associated dissemination and capacity building activities from the third plan of action of the task force on displacement and the second five-year rolling work plan of the executive committee, the WIM executive committee sees itself as being well positioned to play a key role in providing technical guidance in identifying challenges and opportunities for integrating human mobility in national planning processes. And on that basis, we look forward to exploring ways of maximizing synergies with and among all relevant stakeholders, including the stakeholders that uh, and organizations that have organized this side event this afternoon. So, and with these uh, opening comments, I'd like to close and thank again the organizers for inviting me. Back to you. 
Thank you, um, Fraud. Um, I would uh, now move into the discussion. I think these uh, introductory remarks frame very well the, qu the questions we have and the space that we, we should cover. Um, I am very pleased to present to you the panelists uh, that we have today. We are joined by Ms. Coco Warner, which is the director of IOM Global Data Institute. Ms. Warner will provide a data overview on issues of climate change and human mobility and how evidence could help adaptation planning. Welcome. We will unfortunately not have Ms. Stella Drukusic, the head of air policy and climate change directorate of the Ministry of Environment and of the government of Moldova, but we will have um, with us today, Professor Harold Sturley, who's a senior social scientist at the University of Vienna. He's a human geographer who focuses on spatial and social aspects of migration, environment, and technology, and will go through uh, the questions about mainstreaming migration in NAPS in Moldova and other countries of the region. Thank you so much for coming, Professor. I would also like to say and to introduce to you a representative from one of our esteemed co-organizers, Ms. Sabine Minger, the Senior Policy Advisor on Climate Change at Bread of the World. Ms. Minger will share how climate policies can help to address human mobility in the context of climate change. Welcome. And finally, I would like to say hello and thank you for joining us and very pleased to have here Ms. Catherine Brown, Policy Advisor on Refugees and Human Rights Issues at the Evangelical Church in Northern Germany and Research Associate at the Center for Global Migration Studies from the University of Göttingen, representing ACT Alliance. Ms. Brown will share how international law and migration governments can address human mobility in the context of climate change. Thank you to all the panelists. It will be a pleasure to listen to all of you. I would now invite Ms. Coco Warner to make her presentation, but we seem to have technological challenges. <laughs> we can actually make that work to our advantage because death by PowerPoint, you've probably all had very, very long days. Um, first, thanks so much to the WIM XCOM and Froda for your opening comments and to Manuel for organizing the side event with all of these um, important partners. And thanks for the introduction. When you look at data or modeling, because a lot of what climate change impacts mean for society and the systems upon which we depend, a lot of this is unfolding. And we don't have observations about everything. The baseline is changing. But we notice when it comes to modeling about climate change impacts on people and people on the move, the models are really important but they go in opposite directions in some cases. In some cases, models will suggest people are gonna get stuck. Climate change is advancing so rapidly at such a quick scale and at such a big temporal scale that you'll have trapped populations. Other models suggest X, Y number of, of people on the move. What is a policymaker to do? It's really a challenge. One of the things that IOM is moving towards in our own modeling um, is to, whereas a lot of models have looked at the biophysical impacts and projections of climate change, we're shifting the focus just a little bit. We know that risk from IPCC is a function not only of biophysical disruption, but also exposure, whether that's temporal, or spatial, or these systems like food systems, as well as vulnerability. And the combination and interaction of both the biophysical disruption, vulnerability, and exposure shapes people's responses. And so we're moving into that space with the data that we do have, together with these amazing partners that we have, to provide policymakers more insight about what the drivers are, how they might combine and what kinds of actions policymakers might take to anticipate, and literally what you said, Frode, to avert, minimize, and address those impacts where and when they emerge. And I have an amazing PowerPoint, and all of you can have it, but I won't share it with you right now. <laughs> um, but just to kind of give you a little bit of a, 
of a view of what we're going to be bringing to you. The next installment, we're going to bring you some scenarios of what those interactions could look like. We're going to bring you a people-centered approach. And again, it's, it's just wonderful. Among many of you here, civil society, you of anyone have brought that human face of climate change here to the climate negotiations. We're going to work together on that. We're also working together with partners that inform the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You've heard of different modeling, whether that's of RPCs with the emissions trajectories, but also the shared socioeconomic pathways. Those are narratives. We're going to bring you some of those pieces of ways to think about climate change impacts on human mobility. So the next time that we get together, we'll be able to have those more in-depth conversations. And again, the focus is going to be people-centered and the what if. What would policy need to do to avert, minimize, and address? What would the many instruments that we have here in these halls um, or the things that are literally being shaped right now a couple of meters away in different rooms led by different leaders, what would those instruments need to look like to really meet the people who are at the heart and center of everything that we're doing? Um, really, maybe I could stop there because we're missing my amazing PowerPoint presentation. Um, but I want to just welcome all of you to continue the conversation, continue the data work and analysis, and we really look forward to the next steps in the, in the path together. Thanks. Thank you so much, Manuel, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Koku, and I think we need to improvise because climate change will not necessarily play as a role uh, as a book. Uh, and so this uh, event seems uh, to be the same. I would now uh, invite uh, the professor to present to us and talk to us a bit through his uh, remarks. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, for me to be here. Um, I'm not a professor. Maybe yet, I have to admit. <laughs> Nevertheless, Promote. I'm a senior scientist in, in, in that. Um, yes, I shall pass greetings from Stella Juchok from the uh, Ministry of Environment of the Republic of Moldova, um, on whose behalf I'm sitting here. And I want to show you very briefly what uh, the IOM, in cooperation with the University of Vienna, is doing together with the government of the Republic of Moldova um, to improve um, um, adaptation in a very specific way. Um, the idea of this cooperation is to include and mainstream a wide range of human mobility aspects into the national adaptation planning of the Republic of Moldova. Um, just to give you a very brief background, um, um, when it comes to Europe, Moldova is definitely one of the most vulnerable, probably the most vulnerable uh, country to climate change impacts, um, specifically with uh, droughts, uh, floods, heat waves uh, playing a major role um, in the country's um, um, economy and social ecological fabric. Um, the impacts of these events on the livelihoods in Moldova especially strong also because Moldova is uh, one of the poorest countries in Europe um, and is highly depending, especially the rural population, highly depending on agriculture with a large proportion of, of um, farmers being smallholder farmers. Um, yeah, um, at the other side, migration, um, especially international migration, is and have been a defining characteristic of this small country, with um, about half of the labor force of the country being abroad in other countries. 25% um, um, of all households are uh, receiving remittances and being dependent on international remittances to a certain degree, and roughly 15, 16% of the GDP consisting of these remittances. So migration plays a very important role or, already for, for the country. Um, what is aggravating the impacts of climate uh, events and climate change in the past years was the effect of the COVID pandemic, the social and economic costs that that brought, and especially at the moment, the refugee crisis brought uh, by the war in Ukraine, um, with Moldova having 
proportionally to the size of the population, the highest share of, of uh, Ukrainian refugees, uh, hosting refugees in the country. Well, to address migration in the context of climate change and uh, different ranges and, and aspects of uh, climate mobilities, including displacement uh, by disasters, but also the specific vulnerabilities of refugee populations in the, within the country being specifically vulnerable against climate risks, um, and including the potential contribution of migration and all these remittances to adaptation, the government of um, um, the Republic of Moldova um, has embarked on a journey to include migration and these different aspects of climate mobilities into the second national adaptation plan that the country is currently drafting. Um, this endeavor is led by the Ministry of Environment um, and in, uh, a person by Mr. Laduchuk, um, who is who should be sitting here, but is uh, in some other important meetings at the, at the COP here. Um, and the ministry cooperates with the IOM and the University of Vienna for implementing this uh, mainstreaming or integration of uh, mo climate mobility into the National Adaptation Plan. Um, there's a large range of other national um, stakeholders and international stakeholders, different departments and ministries involved because as we should acknowledge when it comes to the different types or pathways that migration and mobilities can take um, with regard to climate change, um, usually these fall under the responsibilities of different um, sections or institutions. Displacement is uh, very often addressed by a different agency than uh, um, refugees, uh, refu managing refugees camps and ensuring that climate vulnerabilities of refugees are, are minimized. Um, migration in the context of the new European, European New Green Deal, for example, where there might be or there will be probably lots of labor redundancies, but also additional labor demand for implementing greening uh, the economy, greening agriculture, energy transitions, important as well for a country um, as Moldova with lots of migrants abroad. So there's a range of government stakeholders that are involved in this process. Um, and uh, the, uh, it needs to be mentioned probably that this is the second NAP that Moldova is formulating. In the first NAP, migration was uh, not featuring very prominently. Basically, it was was not appearing in there. But with regard to the importance of, uh, of uh, as I lined out, migration, um, the government decided to include all these aspects in the NAP too. Um, well, there are in different aspects and ways how this is done. One is obviously uh, to address the lack of knowledge and, um, and facts that is there in Moldova, like in many other contexts as well. So the one aspect of this uh, cooperation is a case study on climate change impacts on livelihoods and on migration decision making and on the impacts of migration and remittance sending and investment on adaptive capacities and adaptive actions and vulnerability reduction in the rural areas in Moldova. Um, the second part is a number of trainings of all these different uh, governmental stakeholders and non-governmental stakeholders on various aspects of uh, climate mobilities. Um, national, national level stakeholders involved in um, planning and, and uh, outlining the national adaptation planning process, but also local and uh, sectoral stakeholders who will be more involved in implementing the National Adaptation Plan. Um, the third part is the elaboration of a supplement or guidebook on how and what steps and in what aspects migration and climate mobilities can be integrated in uh, National Adaptation Planning. Um, and uh, together with uh, the stakeholders in Moldova, we are currently formulating a draft of this, well, handbook, quite a hands-on document that uh, comes directly out of this process um, and that is currently also tested and implemented in, in other countries. Yeah, actually, these are the three fields largely that um, uh, how, how this um, process of including or how, how we rather um, came to, to frame it more mainstreaming 
different aspects of climate mobilities in national adaptation plans. Um, the planning is currently in the draft phase uh, and we are waiting for the, the la latest or last revisions and it should be finalized in the next uh, couple of months. Um, maybe one thing that needs to mention that um, also due to the strong involvement of uh, the IOM in uh, the region of Central Asia, there has been cooperation um, with, has been co regional and trans or international cooperations with this topic also started um, in other countries, um, notably with the governments of Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, where similar processes are taking part in, in different stages um, and also beyond that. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's the, the, the part from, from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And since we changed the order of the presentations, I will return to Coco with the technolo technological issues uh, resolved to allow her the five minutes that were missing from her because it's solved. Here it is. That never happens that they give you the microphone back. Thank you so much. <laughs> we are ahead of time because we skipped. That's fine. Okay. Um, because you probably got the main idea. When it comes to understanding what does climate change mean for people, people on the move, people who stay, um, and ultimately how do we avert and minimize and address those impacts so that people can really ideally achieve those climate resilient pathways. Um, the focus isn't just on biophysical. I think a lot of us in our minds or at least I know for me, I can think in terms of black and white, almost like a Hollywood movie. You can think of life today, which is beautiful, and what a beautiful almost summer day. Or you can think of like a Hollywood movie where things are really, really unimaginably different, and it's hard to think of in between. So our modeling approach the IOM is going to be taking, we're at the beginning or, or kind of the, the stages that we are now, is to fill in the blanks about vulnerability and exposure and what that might mean to people's responses. So here's some things that we know on the, on the last slide, which is, oh, thank you very much. So let's see if I can go back. We know from, and IDMC is here in the room today, um, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center aggregates um, data about global displacement. And here are some of their figures, over 200 million people displaced in relation to weather-related disasters worldwide in the past decade. That's a lot of people. Many of these people are living in protracted situations. And if you look at this, this small global map with those little blue dots, you see that climate-related stressors affect every region of the world. All of us are familiar with our families and our communities with some of these impacts. Now, I'm not talking about uh, the attribution issue, but all of us are affected. Now, what we don't know are all of the things that we would need to know to inform operations. And IOM, among many of you, we're a big operational organization. So we want to know who are, the who are the people, what do they need? How do we intervene in ways that are helpful? All of those are questions that are going to take us into this next generation of modeling and data and analysis. These are just a few more facts. By mid-century, science estimates that about one, pil one billion people in coastal areas are expected to be exposed to these biophysical disruptions, really concerning. Um, we know that the global population that ex is expected to be exposed to river floods might increase by about 120% at the two degrees warming scenario ahead of us, by the end of the century, about half of the human population may be exposed to really severe heat. And for mammals, that is nighttime temperatures that don't go below 36 degrees or our body temperature for a few nights running, or daytime temperatures around 50 degrees, we're already seeing those temperatures all around the world. It's very concerning. And up to 65 million additional people are projected to experience different degrees of food insecurity. So we know something about what the top line 
biophysical disruptions might be, but how could people react? I'm not sure. So that's where we want to fill some of the blanks. What our part of this solution is, is that we have this large global infrastructure of data collection. Some of you are familiar with the displacement tracking matrix of IOM. Some of you are partners. It's pretty big. We operate over 400 country missions, 13,000 data enumerators. That is so many people going out, talking to frontline communities, 700 data coordinators, and I could just go on and on. We help inform almost all humanitarian action. Now imagine the potential of working together to use that data collection infrastructure in hard to reach places to really get a sense of what do frontline communities experience, what do they need, and how can action, climate action, that brings us all together, help address those, avert, minimize, address some of those, some of those impacts. So I've already talked about this slide, and I'll just end with just a look at this is this is a, a map of one of the many, many areas that we're active with many of you. And ultimately, it's all about people. We need, we are, and we need to continue taking a people-centered approach. And I just keep saying the same thing over and over to understand, are we talking males, females, children? older people, because ultimately our climate action is going to land with communities. And there's a tremendous amount of potential, but also big challenges. And so our part is to work together, provide data and analysis that meets the needs of the questions that are here at the tables, um, not only the climate negotiations, but many other policy and action spaces. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Koku. In, in, in having that perspective on data that you have provided, the conversations that we had about how governments have and need to continue invest in adaptation, I would now turn to our colleagues Sabine and Catherine for their 12-minute presentation of what is to actually call to action, what they, on the research that they've been doing, are seeing our priorities, that we can complement each other and move this forward. The floor is yours. Can you put the presentation on? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. And uh, Coco just said uh, it's all about people, and that's also the, the work and the concern of the Danish Church Aid, uh, Brett uh, for the World, my employer, and the Act Alliance. We are brothers and sisters under this umbrella of the Act Alliance, humanitarian aid organizations and development um, organizations. So we are working with the people who are impacted by climate-related um, um, uh, human mobility, and uh, I would like to bring the civil society calls for action uh, in this uh, distinguished panel discussion by presenting um, um, a publication that we did together. It's called Addressing the Protection Gap. Ah, you have it here now, good. Human mobility and the climate crisis in international frameworks. Next one. So we tried uh, to uh, give an overview about the existing uh, policy for us, also to strengthen our own civil society voices into the decision-making processes. And we also saw that we have a lack of capacity ourselves and uh, identified the relevant policy areas where we have to get act um, active and also identified the entry points for civil society action and um, we, um, please, um, the next one. So, uh, Katrine and me, we will just present you some key findings out of that and our calls of um, action, and I will focus only on the um, climate change policies because that's my background, and I'm in the process now for not as long as Coco, but long enough to um, give you some insights from civil society perspective. So what we have seen now in the uh, na uh, nationally determined contribution, national adaptation plans, I'm actually grateful to hear that now in the second national uh, adaptation plans, Moldovia has picked up uh, migration, uh, human mobility. 
So in a few did already, there's an increasing number, nearly half of them have uh, at least mentioned or referred to human mobility in their updated NDCs and NAPs, but still there is no reference uh, to other frameworks. So existing protection mechanisms uh, such as the Global Compact for Migration or Global Compact for Refugees um, is not, um, they are not working enough together. Um, a greater coherence is required between the policy areas, such as climate policy, adaptation, disaster risk reduction, um, um, existing frameworks and guidelines for internally displaced persons and migrants, for example. And there is, of course, also a lack of resources and capacity, especially poor countries who are heavily impacted yeah, to develop um, and implement long-term approaches to tackle the complex field of uh, human mobility in the context of climate change. We also find is obviously civil society participation is central and also it's uh, central that affected the, the voices of the affected communities in the decision making processes. So to monitor the uh, political processes that are going on, please. Human mobility in a context uh, in climate change, I can also keep it very short, it's nearly zero. So um, there are a few exceptions, uh, especially when it comes to resettlement programs, and that is also because resettlement is uh, seen as a form of adaptation, uh, but um, anything else is barely covered by existing climate finance mechanisms and funds. There are no programs under climate finance. Now, I only focus on climate finance. No programs related to internal displaced uh, persons and no social protection com components for arriving uh, migrants. However, there is a large information gap and also a lack of access for affected communities to climate finance. And that is a topic for itself that we discuss on other side events to get access to the existing funds that I cannot outline here in detail. But if it comes to human mobility, it's barely covered. The my main obstacle is, of course, that there is hardly uh, finance available. High emitting countries are escaping their responsibility. Adaptation finance is brutally underfinanced, and so far there is no cent on the table for loss and damage. And that is crucial now that we are setting up now a loss and damage fund based on the polluter space principle, which should also be designed needs based when we talk about the scale. Um, of the fund that human mobility has to be covered by uh, not only the fund, but also the mosaic uh, uh, decisions, so by also the entire loss and damage finance mechanisms that will hopefully be set up. In summary, to keep it short, yes, human mobility has been discussed for a very long time. I think now for 30 years it has been part of these negotiations and it is also on the negotiation table um, since uh, a long time, and, but it is still not uh, sufficiently included in climate policy. And um, we see that it is included in some policy adaptation programs, but the reference are very vague and remain unimplemented so far. And there is a massive lack of finance, of adaptation finance, and 100% lack of finance for loss and damage, where uh, we have to make sure the people impacted by uh, climate change and need to flee and need to migrate, we need to be resettled, have to, be, um, have, to have access to those finance. Katalina? Sorry. So thank you, Sabine. Um, so processes in, migrant po in migration policy and in the field of international law are, compared to climate uh, policy, very, very slow and also contradictory when it comes to enable mobility, um, especially on the side of the polluter states. So at the moment, as we speak, the ministers of interior in the European Union are discussing the proposal for reform to the common asylum system, which would further undermine the right to asylum. And this is really important also for uh, just to, to, to um, think about also climate change and climate crisis um, and for adequate measures to include climate change into um, all the discussions about access and um, admission. 
So even if there are a few instruments in the field of international and humanitarian law, um, protection remains inadequate. There is a huge protection gap, especially cross-border migration, cross-border movement um, in the context of slow onset events. And this lack includes issues of admission, of stay, and access to fundamental rights. So the lack of regular pathways forces people to take life-threatening migration routes and exposes them to situations of vulnerability, such as labor exploitation, human rights violations, and death. And um, actual figures are suspected to be much higher, but there are numbers from the IOM. Since 2014, we have 56,000 deaths at the border. So these are numbers that are really important just to have in the, in the mind. Because the majority of it takes place, of migration takes place within the region, regional agreements to enable mobility are central. Existing regional protocols such as the OAU Convention for Refugees in Africa and the Cartagena Convention, which offer temporary protection, could be a base for further initiatives. However, long-term solutions are also needed here, and if return is not possible. The question of return is highly discussed, and, uh, and it is it is really crucial because we, we observe now progress within the human rights framework. This could be an entry point for additional protection claims uh, following the principle of non refoulement This prevents states from sending people back to places where their right to life might be at risk. Um, the impact of climate crisis should be considered in status decisions and also in return procedures. And what we want is uh, additional protocol for climate-related protection. Also, st states have to consider co more complementary pathways, such as resettlement programs, humanitarian visa, community sponsorships. But also here we have the problem, and there is a great deal of discretion in deciding whether and under what conditions to accept people on the move. And here, protection, this is really an important claim for us, protection should not be defined by economic utility. Regarding internal, internally displaced peoples, although legal instruments and guidelines exist, the implementation is still inadequate, and states lack of capacity and financial, um, they need really financial support. So, next one. <laughs> In the field of migration policy, overall, we can say there is a lack of regular pathways. There are ongoing processes, and yes, there are initiatives. We have labor agreements, we have different kind of, of, of mobility schemes, but um, the specific situations of vulnerability is not taken into account. In migration policy processes, just the global compacts for migration and on refugees, the non-binding nature and the high degree of discretion hinder the development and implementation of reliable migration pathways. And here, the important thing is that we are talking about huge groups of persons. So all these solutions we do have at the moment are really individually. And, uh, and the next point is that the biggest problem is the lack of political will. There is a north-south divide regarding discourses, interests, and solutions, and those most affected are left to fend for themselves, especially when it comes to provide legal and safe pathways. Although the Global North supports fighting the causes of flight and also is engaged in adaptation and finance, the focus is still, and this is on a political level, de facto on securing the borders, then facilitating mobility and migration. And this is really a controversial thing that we have to deal with and we have to just to use all the arenas where we can discuss this also. As Sabine already mentioned, there is a lack of coherence between national and sub-regional approaches to the GCM and state commitments and to the uh, climate action processes such as the NAP. So it would be interesting what, what you will tell us after, maybe. There's a high demand because, sorry, furthermore, we are far away from people-centered, human right-based approaches. There is a high demand, and especially in migration policy, for more inclusions and participation of civil society organization and affected communities. And the last one, I'm finishing now, um, to address the protection gap, it is important to have tailored solutions. This is clear, we have different forms of climate change, we have really different uh, forms of mobility. And in addition to the existing pathways that are 
that, that, that enable work and study, the application of the room, human rights-based frameworks needs to be strengthened. This is really important. States should also provide pathways for migrants in situations of vulnerability based on humanitarian and compassionate grounds, such as developed in the context of the Global Compact for, migrations, uh, for Migrants in the work stream on climate change. It is important and uh, not to put the right to move protected and with dignity against the right to stay. States need to recognize that human mobility is a depth and strategy, but it is also loss and damage. And it is important also to avoid conditionality and to resist the politicization of climate finance to hinder mobility. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine and Catherine and the other participants. I think this has been very interesting because the different perspectives on how we see these bring us also together to finding the common solutions. But the piece that is missing now is your opinion. So I would like to invite everyone in the audience to bring questions and let's make these more interactive. We actually saved a couple of minutes and we can dedicate them to you instead of us here in the panel. So who's the first person to whom I will give a microphone? Thank you, um, and thank you to all the panelists for a really interesting discussion. Um, my name is Kalia Barkai, and I'm a researcher from South Africa, but currently based at University of Potsdam, looking into forced displacement due to climate change. Um, so I have two questions. I'll try to keep them brief, because I'm sure there's other questions. Um, but the first one is directed more so at Koga Warner, um, about how the IOM is modeling um, migration due to climate change when there are so many other factors in migration decisions, how can we come up with a somewhat accurate estimation um, for that? And then my second one is directed more towards Sabine about the international law. Um, and I'm wondering whether a human rights-based approach is sufficient for something like this because non refoulement hasn't been used in the doesn't have precedent really to protect those who might face poverty and other socioeconomic threats in their home countries. So when it comes to something like facing climate ch change threats, um, I wonder if a global mechanism that protects such displaced population requires um, stronger legitimacy or stronger responsibility uh, for those impacts. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can do a few rounds. Please introduce yourselves and identify the person you want to answer because that will simplify our lives. First, this lady and then the gentleman on the corner. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you so much for your wonder, wonderful presentation. My name is Maria. I am a PhD student in law uh, from Cornell University. Uh, my question is related to the principle of the polluter pays principle. I think that throughout these days, there, there have been, um, this principle has been mentioned quite a lot. And I was wondering whether it could be opposable to corporations uh, and big corporations, for example, fossil fuel corporations, oil and gas, that emit the most. And also, because of that fact, they um, produce um, extreme weather events that cause displacement. So is there a way to actually oppose this principle that applies to national states, to corporations, uh, for these corporations to actually pay and um, respond to the displacement caused by emissions and you know climate change? Thank you. OK, thank you for the wonderful presentations here. <laughs> It's Nico Humalista, part of the Finnish delegation, and um, coming from the Finnish Evangelic Lutheran Mission, uh, having background in uh, different kind of development and humanitarian uh, projects. And one topic that we are engaging with is disability inclusion in climate change. So my question would be directed to Coco Warner, and uh, whether there is any data sets or any understanding of the situation of the persons with disabilities when it comes to the mobility uh, when facing this climate crisis, because I think it's kind of evident that they are among the most vulnerable, but there is very little, at least for me, I, I, I don't know the data. So if there is any avenues of investigating it further, then I would like to hear it, and perhaps somebody else as well. 
And the second question would be uh, then directed to Catherine Brown, because I, I, I think among the challenges is that uh, at least at the national level, but also I think in the sphere of international discussions as well, uh, the persons with disabilities haven't been represented quite well within the spheres of policy making. So I was wondering, what do you see these kind of avenues and opportunities in terms of allowing the participation about actually turning it into practice that nothing about us without us? Thank you. One more question. <clears throat> oh, okay. Um, so this question is mostly directed to Sabina, but the, the panel in general. Uh, so my name is Miklos Espremi. I used to work with Thomas Hirsch. So um, uh, my question is around um, the, the whole topic of indigenous knowledge and indigenous cultures and how that has been integrated into this guide or, or not, um, since that might also be um, strategically a, a very good aspect to include to also in, uh, increase the number of stakeholders um, that want to change these problems that you described. Thank you very much. My name is Gordon Rattray. I work for European Disability Forum. Um, I was delighted to hear uh, my colleague there, I think from Finland, um, talking about the, the need for inclusion of persons with disabilities. In fact, he has articulated what I wanted to ask very well. Um, all I would do is add to his uh, question and comment by saying that European Disability Forum, so the organization that I work for, did a review in 2021 of government policies on disaster risk reduction um, across Europe and Central Asia, so covering 55 countries. And we found that there was virtually no mention at all of disability inclusion in any climate action plans or disability uh, disaster risk reduction plans in any of those countries. So that gave us an overview of um, the policy question. And then just to, to add again, um, that disability inclusion is not just about ensuring that these people, 15% of the population, um, are included in the work, but actually that uh, our experience and knowledge and um, abilities and uh, yeah, the experience that people with disabilities have um, are brought in to, to support the rest of society. So disability inclusion is a, a real driver for inclusion of many other marginalized groups. I think, I think we can have one more question if there's any other volunteers that want to do. Otherwise, we will go to the questions. And I think our panel has their work cut for them because they received precise instructions of who should answer each question. So I'm, I'm very happy. Who wants to be the first one? Sabine? Yeah, um, I'm happy to answer, of course, the question on Poluta's PACE principle. Yeah. So. Um, the entire finance architecture uh, under the UNFCCC is based on a polluter pace principle, however you define it, and who is polluter. So um, uh, definitely um, uh, it is not working very well. No? We see that there is still like there are massive gaps and uh, the climate finance is not needs-based so far. Um, at the moment, we have a great momentum here uh, in the negotiations as um, by setting up the loss and damage finance, um, uh, fi the loss and damage fund, innovative finance sources are also uh, discussed because it's clear we have here a scope of finance that is needed of around uh, 300 to 600 billion US dollar a year. That is nothing that federal budgets can, can deal with. So windfall profits from the fossil fuel industry has to be approached. It has to be part of that. And they are benefiting uh, so far and from climate change and burning fossil fuels by those we are talking about today are those who are not part of the problem but who have to, to bear the burden. So yes, definitely, uh, fossil fuel industry uh, and the windfall profits, they have to be part of this innovative finance source that I discussed here. Also aviation and shipping um, has to be, um, uh, is also under discussion at the moment, which where I also believe that an aviation levy or shipping levy is at the moment actually something that is uh, 
that it's not, um, we call it in Germany, music in the future, but it's something that is a low-hanging fruit at the moment to approach and to ease the federal budgets because it's impossible that they will carry this. So polluter pays principle has to really come now into action and bring the industries in who are benefiting from burning fossil fuels and it has to hurt their own profits now. Thank you. Um, indigenous people knowledge has to be, uh, that was a question that was raised by you in the third row who is not looking at me now. Hi. So, um, yes, of course, in all planning, if it's adaptation planning, adaptation projects are uh, now related now, human mobility in the context of climate change, indigenous uh, people's knowledge is, is uh, fundamental yeah, in all these planning processes. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that should be core of any uh, planning processes. Totally agree with that, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Sabine and Manuel. What a great moderator, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I'll just bundle my answers in two clusters. So for our wonderful researcher from South Africa, I missed your first name, but I was listening. You were asking about how IOM is modeling um, migration, maybe also displacement in the context of climate change. And I noticed that you mentioned numbers so uh, we've been thinking about this for a while, and there are a number of studies out there in the world that create number projections. Now, I'm going to be a bit of a pain in the neck and just push back on that with a, a ton of respect to all of the very good friends and colleagues who have spent blood, sweat, and tears and months and months and years creating these models. They've been so important because they have in some ways brought the issue to the attention of the world stage. There's not a, work, a week that goes by that literally a world leader doesn't talk about climate change and migration, or I could go on. So they've been really valuable. Now, what we're talking about here is action, adaptation, building resilience, and Froda, I keep pointing to you the averting, minimizing, addressing for people, how much does answering the question, how many people will move, help you in your day-to-day -day work? Manuel has spent so many years um, working with people who are in a shelter situation. So I could have that conversation with you. What we're trying to do with the next generation of modeling is to answer questions that, let's say, build on the shoulders of what's come before, but really ask questions like, where? And when, at what rates might people move? Who are moving? Are they children? Children have special needs, especially protection needs. Um, what are their abilities? Um, et cetera. So the who and when and what and where, what do they need? What are their priorities? How do people see themselves and what their objectives are? Migration, for example, can be an aspiration. If you're a student, as some of you are, having the chance to go to another country, you count as a migrant because you have to get a visa. But that's what we want. We want to build a good future for our young people. And I think it's those kinds of questions that are informing our modeling and that hopefully are also useful for operations. Now, um, both to Nico and Michiel, uh, no, excuse me, it's Michiel and, no, it's Nico and Gordon. You had both asked about data sets on um, disability. So I did a quick look, and if you go to Data World, there are currently about 80 data sets that reflect some element of disability. It has to do with things like health, vocational, housing, and accessibility census data. There's clearly not enough, but there's an al also a resource, perhaps you built it, um, on the data portal, which contains 40 data sets um, from so many countries worldwide. There's clearly a lot more work to do, and some of you who are advocates here in climate change, as well as in the world of disaster risk reduction, have again brought this topic to the world stage and have done tremendous work, a lot more work to do. The last thing that I would say, actually, let me just stop. I think I've talked enough, thanks.
I was probably going to stop you anyhow, but um, in any case, I wanted to allow also, of course, um, uh, to <laughs> to allow Catherine to, to answer, but let me put Catherine, after you talk, to pass to Harold to tell us a bit how does he see in the process of the NAPs the, not only the inclusion of different, the, the broad spectrum of inclusion, but also how uh, indigenous knowledge is seen, because I think it's important to have a bit of a perception on how this is incorporated in NAPS. NAPS de facto then set the, 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 the pathway forward. So first Catherine and then Harold. Yes, thank you. I would have that same questions, but about the, uh, the different frameworks, uh, how they are included. Um, in, within the NAP. So thank you for the question. Of course, as I mentioned, the human rights framework is not sufficient. That is clear, and that's why I also mentioned we need group-specific solutions, and of course, ECOVAS and all these free movement agreements, economic free movement agreements, are really good tools and important tools. We support that, and we need that much more. We need it. We need regional agreements, uh, labor agreements, low-level forms of mobility that enable people also to move, just like uh, with low grade of, of bureaucracy to neighboring countries. This is really important. Um, and um, but what I wanted to highlight is that. We really need, at the moment, the question of human rights, and I think for, for us, because we are here also, just like uh, sitting here for, from a human rights perspective, is that the situation of vulnerable migrants is really not being addressed sufficiently. And the, the really important it is to have in mind that we need a different, different, really different kinds of solutions to, 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 to migration and to, to human mobility with working on labor schemes, we also need uh, solutions that are human rights based. And this is what I was talking about. You, you asked the question about uh, disability. We know that people on the ground are those with less opportunities to migrate. So we really have, we, we have this, this situation that we need to ensure that, for example, reception conditions are ensured. We have to know that uh, internally displaced people, that there is infrastructure. We need finance also. And this is a question of loss and damage. We never discuss this. But it is really a question, for, for a question of, of how to support the most vulnerable. And um, so you are totally, and thank you for your question, because you are totally right. We need a lot of forms and economic free, uh, free uh, oh. <laughs> Free movement agreements based on economic uh, like regions are important, but we have also the question just to pick the best of it. And this is what I re was referring to, the economic utility. And this is what I see that our role is here, just to focus also, to put the lens on those that, uh, so just that no one will be left behind. So this is really important. And regarding the question of disability, as I also mentioned, I'm really interested how the NAPs are also including this in Moldavia, because um, most of them will not be able to move. So m most of, of, of people with disabilities belong to the internally displaced people. So there, this is, and there is this lack of what I told you about, this lack of, of capacities, but also of financial resources. We have guidelines. We have guidelines how for, for internally displaced people, but states do not have the capacities. They really need support there. So just to conclude there, and I'm really interested a lot of questions yeah. in one nap. <laughs> you hoo thanks a lot. Well, to some, I have answers to some, not, not really fully. Um, let me start with um, maybe the easiest to answer, how to bring together or to ensure that relevant stakeholders are included there. So I think one, one key idea of how IOM takes on this, this NAP process is to have a spectrum of different mobilities uh, and types of mobilities in here. Just, just to name a few, there's the big four disaster displacement, mobility, relocation, resettlement, and uh, labor migration or migrations adaptation. Um, but there are many more. Um, distress migration, not, to, not due to um, environmental or sh quick or sudden onset disasters, but to roads or to slowly and gradually changing uh, environmental conditions. 
Um, there are mobile populations such as pastoralists or fisher folks um, whose mobilities are affected by, by climate change. Um, there are migrants, labor migrants, in, in uh, vulnerable situations, in hazardous environments, in uh, marginal settlements, in, in uh, places of, of destination. But they're also displaced, internally displaced, and in refugees in, in vulnerable situations. Um, as I mentioned, there, there are m migrants in the context of uh, existing labor migrants or future migrants or redundancy of labor migrants in the context, the whole context of greening economies. Um, there's also displacement due to adaptation actions. You're thinking of of, um, um, of uh, biofuels, for example, right? So this the whole area of and there there are some more. Um, so we try to cover all these and then to look for identify relevant stakeholders who is in there in, in the government context responsible working on these. Identify overlaps and synergies, but also gaps who is not in there. Take governments. Um, at their commitment to international agreements, right to the to the, um, for example, to implementing the recommendations of the task force for displacement, um, which is a, a great entry point for for getting the stakeholders on the table, and then together with these stakeholders, um, working out the relevant, contextualized places and and fields of uh, of interest of relevance, and then finding entry points for action. So this is the broad frame. Then disabled groups, I think especially in, in if we talk about these different dimensions or, or types of mobilities, um, spe specific vulnerabilities, if we, we think all this is a kind of, a, I would say, intersectional um, dimensions where disability, ethnicity, uh, language ability, um, gender, of course, wealth, et cetera, et cetera, play a distinct role in shaping specific vulnerabilities of groups. Um, in these different contexts and their needs uh, for for equitable addressing. Indigenous knowledge, I think it's not yet in there. That's something we have to look at, definitely. Thank you, Harold. Right on time. Uh, I would actually, before I say something, and I, I probably should not say anything, uh, which is better to ask, Frodo, do you want to give a bit of feedback from how th that you that sit on the negotiations that have such a responsibility and, and listen to the different parts. How do you see the perspectives and the questions pointed here today? And if there is any recommendation that you may have to us on areas that we need to invest more so that the parties that you engage with can have and make better decisions. I know it's a big ask, but it's, it's not about a solution, it's about is there an area that you see that we need collectively in our different ways to put more emphasis? And you will be the last person to talk today. <laughs> Uh, what an honor that you are allowing me <laughs> to come in, uh, Manuel, uh, uh, towards this end. Uh, yes, I'll be happy to just offer some, some comments. Allow me to comment before I, I maybe turn to, to your question. Uh, this this uh, discussion on how uh, human mobility displacement is mainstreamed in national adaptation plan, I thought was quite interesting. Partly because we have been developing in our task force on displacement this technical guide. And, and I was fascinated by your explanation about how this has been mainstreamed in the NAP of uh, Moldova. But I, w I would, I, I'm, this is a question I don't know if you, you or anyone else could answer. It would be interesting to see if there's an analysis across uh, the spectrum of all NAPs, actually, uh, w to what extent uh, this is the case also in other uh, NAPs. Uh, I don't know if that ex uh, exists. Because we just saw a study of NAPs that came out recently, uh, prepared by the Global Net. Uh, sorry, um, it's prepared by IISD, um, and uh, it uh, deals with. I think it's called the NAP Global Network, yes. and it makes an analysis of how loss and damage is is reflected in the national adaptation plan. So likewise, it would be interesting to know to what extent also uh, countries in their NAPs uh, are reflecting on 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 these uh, questions of human uh, mobility and displacement. Anyway, so so that was more of a question than, than anything else. I don't, don't know if there's time for for an answer from anyone on on that one. On, on your uh, question more broadly, uh, Manuel, I, I think, I mean, we are here in Bonn now, um, six months after COP27, uh, uh, and obviously I think we're all aware that there was a major breakthrough uh, on a decision on loss and damage in, uh, uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh. 
And the main decision there I'm referring to is the one to develop new financing and, uh, arrangements and, and the fund. And we know that the transitional committee was established. It's been held, uh, holding two meetings so far, and other two meetings uh, are going on. And as for tomorrow and, f and Friday and Saturday, we'll here in Bonn have the Glasgow Dialogue that will address many of these issues and inform the work of the tran transitional committee. So I think that's all about how we can scale up uh, the efforts to avert, minimize, and address uh, loss and damage through finance, through action and support, et cetera. And, and I was fascinated also, I think, um, you mentioned, Sabina, how the polluter pays principle is one of the principles that feeds into the discussion around how we can best design modalities and arrangements for uh, making support available uh, and mobilizing support, uh, that is. So I think those are just some few reflections here. Uh, of course, uh, the WIM Executive Committee that I'm co-chairing is more of a policy arm, not an implementing arm. We have the Santiago Network, which is also being uh, negotiated here uh, in, in Bonn, which is more of a technical assistance arm, um, also helping out on addressing uh, technical issues, and hopefully it will soon be up and running so that uh, support uh, through the Santiago Network can also be made available. I think I'll stop here, Manuel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frod. In, in what a pleasure to be here and having such a diverse panel. We have decision makers, the people that represent countries and the parties. We have people that are thinking on data, colleagues that are researching and understanding these dynamics and, and, and the civil society plea and the academia. So it's a, a true privilege to this. On, on what Nort had said, just to put the perspective, the work done in Moldova is the basis for the guidance that is entering on the task force of displacement to mainstream human mobility in the NAPS. And is that effort joined with silicon trust mapping and IOM mapping that will be the new, hopefully, um, analysis of human mobility on the NAP uh, the um, platform that you said, because we want human mobility, the little sign of human mobility shown in that website. And I will end just with a sentence that I hope it represents the spirit of today. We heard about solidarity, we heard about inclusion, we heard about responsibilities. And at the center of these sits choice. Human mobility is not a problem to be solved. It's an in, in, inherent choice of individuals to be empowered, safe, and with the resources to make decisions about their lives. And this should be whether to stay, whether to move. If we achieve in giving people the opportunity and the resources to make this choice, we have delivered human mobility to the benefit of all. I thank you for having the time with us, and I think we only went four minutes above. My apologies. Thank you for coming, and to all the panelists for being here with us. Thank you.